All right. <clears throat> My message this morning is do it in remembrance of me. Do it. Nike says, just do it. Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. We haven't had communion as a congregation for a while. Now, we have communion cups that we put in the front. The seat in front of you will have a little metal ring, and there's a cup there. And we want to encourage you, any given Sunday, during praise and worship, if you want to celebrate communion, the reason why the cups are there all the time, you could have communion every week if you want, if you want to have it once a month. Occasionally, we will come together and have it as a church. And so I want to have communion today as a church, and I'm going to preach a little bit on communion, all right? So <clears throat> I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 7 to 8. Then came the day of unleavened bread. Now, stop. I'm going to explain unleavened bread in this message. And I'm going to explain a little bit of the Jewish culture and customs and their religious observances. But I want you to take note. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying... Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now that's chapter 22, verse 7 to 8. We're going to skip down to verse 14 and read to verse 20. <clears throat> when the hour came, Jesus said, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again. He's not going to have Passover again until the kingdom of God comes. Now, those of you that have been with me for quite a while, you know I have preached and I've shown you, even from the Greek, erkomahi, the kingdom of God has come. It is a present tense verb. The kingdom of God is happening and the kingdom of God is now. It is a present tense verb. It's around me. That's why earlier in the worship I said the kingdom of God is here. It's in us. It flows through us. The realm of God's authority, his power is here. Miracles don't need to be rare and few. They're meant to be good and plenty. All right? I must be on a food theme. How many people like good and plenties? <laughs> I like good and plenty. My, my head's in the wrong place today. I'm thinking food, Z. Help me. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> All right. Miracles are not meant to be rare and few. They're meant to be good and plenty. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The thief comes to steal, to take, to rob, to destroy. God has come to give us a good life. A great life, an abundant life. Verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I won't eat it again until its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. What's he saying? A day's coming where heaven and earth will kiss again. The Bible says a new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven. I believe that before the fall, there was no second heaven filled with sin. The heavens were filled with the glory of God. Amen. And it was just natural and normal for God to walk on the earth in the cool of the day and for Adam and Eve <coughs> to have <coughs> fellowship with him. Lewis, would you do me a favor? If you go in that door, there's a little white refrigerator, really low, short one. There's water in there for the singers and the preachers. Would you get me a bottle of water? Thank you. Everyone, give Lewis a big round of applause. Job, Lewis. For that, I'll take your order. You have redeemed yourself, my son. Let me, 
Let me clear my throat for a moment. He came out of nowhere. All right. So, a day is coming where heaven and earth will kiss again. And the first heavens that's filled with the demonic realm will be obliterated. There you go. I'm thinking of blotted and obliterated, and I'm mixing the two words together. Obliterated. It will be obliterated and wiped out. And heaven and earth will kiss. The new Jerusalem will come to earth. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to break bread and have a Passover until the kingdom physically comes to earth. You know, the first Passover is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. When all of the body of Christ is finally together in one place. And there's going to be a massive celebration. This is one of those weddings that is celebrated for years, not days. All right? God's going to pour it on. But, <clears throat> verse 17, after taking the cup, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes, in that physical sense. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this broken body, uh, this broken bread is my body. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm striking a new covenant with you, he said, and I'm going to seal that covenant with my blood. What's really interesting is in the culture of men, in humanity, not just gender male, but humanity, if two men or two people were going to make a blood covenant, as history tells us in the past, they would make a cut. The scar would be a sign of the covenant, a constant memory. Once it heals, there's a scar. And they would put their hands together like this and hold hands and point it up like this so that heaven is a witness and the blood would commingle and they make a blood covenant. What's really, really interesting and really, really cool is that salvation is so free that only one person shed their blood, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen. And he made a covenant with you and me. Amen. And you know why that is? Because if you break a covenant, a covenant is broken. Jesus made the covenant knowing full well that at times you and I will fail, we will fall, and we will sin. And then the covenant would be broken because it's a two-part covenant. God sheds the blood and makes the covenant knowing Jesus will never fail. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that is good preaching. It's a great thought. Isn't that awesome, Bill? Amen. So, <clears throat> Jesus said this cup contains the wine, which is symbolic of my blood, which will seal this new covenant. So, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, is the co new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's interesting here that Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 19, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's my title this morning. Do it in remembrance of me. What do we have to remember? Are we going to forget the personage? The person of Jesus Christ. I believe that one of the things that we need to remind ourselves is who Jesus is. We know there's a Jesus Christ. Even history can't erase him. They've changed B.C. and A.D. And uh, they, they use new phrases now to obliterate Christ as the mark in history but history cannot erase the fact 
that there was a Jesus Christ and he was crucified by a Roman world. Jesus Christ, who, who is he? John the Baptist, I shared in my message last week, just before he was about to beheaded, be beheaded, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? So it's a valid question. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to remember who he is, not just that he existed. Amen. And who is he? He is God and he came to earth as a man. And I think that's really important whenever we take communion that we don't just remember the person Jesus Christ, but that we remember God deliberately became flesh and dwelt among us. Anyone here ever get tired on any given day, get tired of life, get tired of stuff? Anybody ever feel like, geez, the world is so and so and so and so, I'm tired of it. Would you raise your hand just for a split second? Okay, before God came to earth, he already knew that. And he came to live here with us. And I shared in the first service that there's a great difference between somebody loving you with pity and somebody loving you with compassion. When somebody loves you with pity, they have mercy on you because they see that you're a wretch, you're broken, you're beneath them. They have pity on you. God doesn't have pity on us. God has compassion on us. And the difference with compassion is, is that the person who shows compassion understands the hurt you hurt with. In other words, compassion enables a person to feel what you're feeling and they are moved with noble emotion towards you. They have compassion. God chose to come to a broken world and live amongst broken people and experience the end result of how broken people act. Let me prove it. And Jesus wept. And Jesus was despised and rejected by men. Sound familiar? The prophet said it. You see, God chose to not have pity on us he chose to be hurt the way we're hurt. He chose to be rejected the way we're rejected. He chose, the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are tempted in every way. Heck, I think about the temptations I've been through and the temptation to knock someone out, the temptation to get angry, the temptation to lust, all of those things. And God says, I don't want to just have pity on you. No, I want to love you in a deeper, more noble way. I'm coming to earth and I'm going to live as you live and I'm going to be rejected <coughs> the way you've been rejected. And I'm going to be harassed the way you've been harassed. And I'm going to experience what you experience because I don't want to be your judge. I want to be your dad. I want to be the one who loves you as you are. Wow, that sounds so much better, doesn't it? Absolutely. John, the apostle of John, writes his gospel. The beloved John. He had a very unique relationship with Jesus. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 14, and verse 18, this is what John tells us. In the beginning was the Word. Everybody say, the Word. Remember that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If I were to read verse 2, verse 2 is not up there. It's not in my notes. But it says, the Word was in the beginning, verse 2. Verse 3 says, and nothing that was created was created without Him. So here's the word, it is eternal. And it was with God, and it is God. And then in verse 14 it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
God didn't choose to live here on earth because earth was better than heaven. God chose to live here on earth even though earth was broken and messed up. That gives me an amazing insight into the heart and the character and the mentality of God. Religion paints him as an angry judge. If he's an angry judge, why would he want to come and feel the pain I feel, go through the rejections I've been through, and be despised? Why would he want to go through the nitty-gritty of a broken world when he's living in heaven surrounded by angels who honor him and know his worth and respect him? He came to earth in this broken world to experience what you and I experience because he wasn't going to have pity on us. He was going to have compassion on us. Amen. God so loved the world. He stepped into ours. What an amazing thought. What an amazing thought. Verse 18, John, uh, verse 14, let me finish it. The word became flesh, made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father and has made him known. I love the fact that towards the end of Jesus' ministry, he's praying, and John's writing down the thoughts that Jesus verbalized. And Jesus, as he's praying, he's talking to the Father, and he says, Father, I have revealed you to them. When Jesus interrupted a group of religious men who were ready to stone an adulteress because they caught her in the act, where were they that they caught her in the act? And Jesus interrupts this very public stoning. And he says, excuse me, guys, I want to put a suggestion forward. How about the first one who throws the stone has to be the one who has never sinned? You know what Jesus was saying? Most of us are like the rest of us. God came to a broken world. And he lived with the effects of broken people. Wounding him, puncturing him, rejecting him, despising him sneering at him. Jesus said, Father, I revealed you. Every man disappeared, not one threw a stone. And Jesus says to this woman, where are your accusers? She says, they're gone. And the only one who had the right to accuse it, the only one who never sinned, Jesus, God in the flesh, he said, everyone's disqualified if you've sinned. The only one allowed to stone her is if they've not never sinned. The only one who could condemn her was left. And he says, woman, neither do I condemn you. This isn't a harsh judge. This is a God who wet his feet with our impurity and he walked in our muddy waters and yet never sinned. And at the end of his 33 and a half years on earth, at the end of seeing Peter deny him, the moment Jesus is being offered up to the Roman soldiers, Peter gets scared and he runs away. He denies Jesus three times. And yes, Peter came back. Jesus still went to the cross for broken people. Even his inner circle deserted him. And this is what he said. He said, I still love them so much. I'm going to pay the price on that cross for the sin of every human being. How will you ever find greater love? It says, I read to you, he came in truth and grace. 
I made a big deal about that in the first message. I almost left it out. But it seems like an insignificant thought. He came with truth and grace. La-di-da. He came with truth and grace. You know what it means? God saw everything that was flying under the radar. He came with truth. He knew what we were like and he came. He walked amongst us and he knew what they were thinking. He came with truth. But if he only came with truth, he would have come with truth and judgment. He came with truth and grace. You see, that's the God that's easy to run to when you've screwed up. That's the God that's easy to run to when you've made a mistake because he walked where you walked and he felt what you felt and he's been tempted in every area just like you're tempted. And he understands and he gets us. And even though he never sinned and he saw even the brokenness of Peter, people like Peter and Thomas, Thomas saw all these miracles and yet when everyone else is saying, he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead, Thomas is going, ah, I'm not going to believe it unless I put my finger in his holes. What are you guys smoking? What have you been drinking? Jesus knew all this stuff was going to go down. And he still went to the cross for Thomas. He still went to the cross for Peter. He still... The whole Jew Jewish nation, the religious leaders rejected him. He still went to the cross for them. That's why John 3.16 is so important. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What are we remembering? The first thing we're remembering is who he is. He's God. It's not just Jesus. Every time you say Jesus, tell yourself, Jesus is God in the flesh. Every time you read something Jesus says in the Bible, that's not a good teacher talking. That's not a good philosopher <clears throat> talking. That's God in the flesh. If anybody's got advice that's worth listening to, God in the flesh is worth listening to. Can I get an agreement? And here's Jesus. What amazing love. God so loved the world that he chose to take on a human form. And even in our brokenness, he walked amongst us and received the sharp edge of our brokenness. He was rejected, despised, lived with them for 33 and a half years, preached for three and a half years. His closest friends rejected him, and he still said, I love you so much. I'm going to pay the price. For every mistake you've made, and I'm going to pay the price for every curse that has come on your life. Now, I'm going to pause my preaching right here because it deserves, not my preaching, but this fact deserves a statement from us. And so I'm going to say, if you appreciate what God has done, if you can appreciate the immensity of this love, the purposeful decision, he came in truth. He knew what he was getting into, but he came in grace. If you can appreciate that and you understand it, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and give him a hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on. Come on. Give him a shout. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for becoming flesh. And dying for us. Amen. You can take your seats. <clears throat> That's why John 3.16 is so significant. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If we were to break that down and put it in an even more modern translation, God loved humanity so much that he became one of us and he died for us so that if we put our trust and our life in him, we will never perish. We will have eternal life with him. Every time we take communion, 
It's not just a good man who died. It's not just a philosopher. It's not just a thinker or an influencer. God became flesh. He came in truth. He knew what we were like. He knew what he was getting into. He knew that even after he died for us and we accept him, we would fall on our face and fail. He came in truth and he came in grace. And if that isn't the measure of how much God loves, I don't know what is. Give me an amen. amen. Praise the Lord. The second thing we need to remember is what he did. The first thing we need to remember is who he is. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. He deliberately put on humanity and experienced humanity. He saw our brokenness before he came. He still did it. He walked with us for 33 and a half years experiencing our brokenness and he still did it. The second thing we need to remember is what did he do? What did he do? The Bible says he is the Lamb of God who takes away sin or the sin of the world. And so we're going to go back to the Gospel of John and John 1 verse 29, the beloved apostle writes this and he's talking about John the Baptist. So there's two Johns. John, the disciple of Jesus, the beloved, and he's about to talk about John the Baptist who came to preach and prepare the way for Jesus. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What did John mean when he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we read these scriptures, Jesus was preparing or getting himself ready for Passover. Passover comes from the story in the book of Exodus when God was about to set the Hebrew people free from 400 years of slavery. For 400 years, they were demeaned. For 400 years, they were displaced. For 400 years, they were nothing more than a day's worth of wager to a slave master. For 400 years, they had no national identity and no self-respect. For 400 years, they were the servants of the higher-uppers' biddings, and they would come when they were told to come here, and they would go. They would make mud bricks all day long in the hot Egyptian sun. Who built the pyramids? The slaves did. They were insulted. They were mistreated. They were devalued. We think of racism today. We think of prejudice today. And there's all sorts of prejudice. And there's all sorts of racism. It doesn't come just in two colors. It comes in every shade. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor Rob. It's not just white and black. It's like tan and cocoa and coffee bean, caramel and dark chocolate and white, white, and it's yellow and it's every color and it's every nationality. And within each color spectrum, there is racism and there is arrogance and there is prejudice. Can I get an agreement? Don't play the race card with me. We're all prejudiced. And we all have to be as loving as God the Father is because he paid the same price for everybody. Amen. We've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've all screwed up. And we all need to, in some way, shut up. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Thank you, Russ. John says, look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the, the, the world. What did he mean, the Lamb of God? Passover comes from the story in Egypt 
in, in Exodus when the people were slaves for 400 years and God was going to set them free. He heard their crying, he saw their pain, and he says to Moses, I'm going to set your people free. He said, now this is what I want you to do. As of today, I want you to mark this as your new year. So the Hebrew people celebrate a different new year than we do. We celebrate the new year January 1st. Their new year starts with seven days of cleaning out their house of any form of yeast. You see, yeast is symbolic of sin. You only need a tiny little bit of yeast in a huge vat of dough. And that yeast will work its way through all that dough. It's like sin. Sin spreads easily. The Apostle Paul says, don't you know that bad company will corrupt good character? Yes. Yes. Hello? And so God says, Moses, I'm going to judge this nation. I'm going to judge Egypt. They've been harsh. They've been cruel. They've been racist. They've uh, devalued U.S. people and other people, they've become proud, they're arrogant, and I'm going to bring you out of slavery, and I'm going to bring your people to their own land, and I'm going to give them national identity, but I am going to give them a greater identity than national identity. I'm going to give them my identity. I'm going to call them my people. You know what God did with you and me? He didn't just forgive us. And give us dignity. He gave us identity in himself. He said, I'm going to call you sons and daughters. He didn't just set a slave free. He didn't just adopt a slave that God set free. He took this slave and he grafted him into his DNA. We're grafted into God. We're grafted into Jesus Christ, and we are sons and daughters. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Passover. God says to Moses, Moses, I want this to be the first day of your new year. You're going to have a different new year than the world around you. I'm separating you as a people. I'm separating you to me. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to start every new year with uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I want you to go for seven days through your house and throw away anything that has leaven because it's symbolic of sin. And during these seven days, I want you to eat unleavened bread. All of this is symbolic of something that is yet to come. But I want you to do the things I tell you because they are a copy of spiritual realities that will one day manifest themselves on earth. And so for seven days, they'd start the new year with cleaning house. They would go through the house and make sure there was nothing that represented sin. And for seven days, they would eat unleavened bread. How many of you know what unleavened bread is? Now listen. I didn't become the person I am by eating unleavened bread. I'm Italian. Uh, give me a good loaf of Italian bread with a nice crusty outer exterior. Give me, I, I, I'm not going to make, <laughs> I'm not going to make a pizza on a wrap. I might need to make a pizza on a wrap. But I am not going to make a pizza on a wrap. Give me some good fluffy dough like French bread that's going to rise and give me something to bite into. Now, I eat unleavened bread occasionally. I have wraps. How many of you eat wraps? I'm not knocking anyone's culture or anything. I eat them. They help me maintain this well-manicured, chiseled physique that I have doing a great job, right? <laughs> Help me, Jesus. <laughs> but I'm going to be honest with you. Eating a wrap with some cold meats and a uh, piece of lettuce in the middle is a little bit like eating cold meats and lettuce in a sheet of newspaper. 
It doesn't have a lot of texture. It doesn't have a lot of flavor, but it's good. It'll give you more fiber than carbohydrates, okay? So it's not a bad thing. But they had to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Why? In the natural, it doesn't make sense unless there's a symbolic significance. And God is saying, I want you to start your new year off searching through your house and removing anything that is affected by sin. Then on the seventh day, I want you to take a firstborn male lamb that has no defects. The one that you would want to reproduce from. You know the prized one that would get the gold ribbon? I want you to sacrifice that one. And what they had to do is they had to set that lamb aside on the first day. So they got seven days of taking yeast out of the house, but on the first day they pick a lamb and the lamb comes to live in the house. He becomes like a pet. He's no longer one of 200 sheep out there. He becomes like a little pet. So the boys and the girls, the kids of the house, they play with the pet. Mom even gets a little bit affectionate with this cute little lamb. It's only a year old. They're very cute. They just go, ba ba, right? Why? Because on the seventh day, after you've removed all the yeast and eaten no leavened bread, on the seventh day, that innocent young lamb that did nothing wrong, that everyone in the house is now bonded with, is going to be slaughtered, and his innocent blood will pay the price for every evil thought we've ever thought, for every evil thing we've ever acted on, for every secret sin that we hope no one will ever find out about, that innocent lamb and his innocent life and his innocent blood will symbolically, an innocent life for a guilty life, exchange. Execution is coming, but an innocent person is going to exchange their life for the guilty. I want you to take the blood of that lamb and paint the doorposts and the lintel above the doorposts and when my judgment comes over Egypt because these people have been arrogant, they have been cruel, they have been destructive, they have been without thought of human life, when judgment comes, the spirit of death will see the blood and he will pass over that house. And that house will be safe. It will be saved. Okay? Okay? And so the Hebrew people celebrate Passover. If we were to read just one or two scriptures from the book of Exodus, in chapter 12, verse 13 to 14, it says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when Israel, or sorry, when I strike Egypt. Verse 14 this is a day you are to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. You know what he's saying? As often as you do this, remember. As often as you do this, remember that an innocent lamb symbolically paid the price for your sins and I am going to take you out of slavery out of a place of darkness and I'm going to bring you to a place of your own, a promised land, a better place, a place of blessings and promises. And when destructive plagues, when death, when anything that could come up from the belly of hell starts to sweep across the nation, it will see the blood of an innocent lamb on your doorpost and it will know, I can't go there, that's trespassing. Come on, give the Lord a hand. I can see some of you are starting to overlay the parallels of Scripture. God told them to to do this for the rest of their lives. Yeah. 
guess. <laughs> I don't know how I muted myself. Smarty pants. Did you put an order in for that linguine? <laughs> Canceled. I need him. He's a great, great help to me personally, and he is a great help in many, many ways in this church. And we love you, Pastor Carlos. You see... When Jesus was preparing for the Passover, it was the day of unleavened bread. That is the seventh day. For seven days, the people of Israel were cleansing uh, yeast out of their house, eating unleavened bread for seven days. On the day of unleavened bread, they sacrificed the innocent lamb. And once they sacrificed it and put the blood on their doorpost, they would roast the lamb and eat all of it. Here's Jesus. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. What was symbolic is now being played out in reality. And Jesus is taking the Passover from the old covenant and he's striking a new covenant and he's saying, I am the fulfillment of the law. I am the firstborn. I'm in the prime of my life. I am a lamb without defect, without blemish. I've never sinned. And he lays his life down and he says, this is my body broken for you. And this is my blood, speaking of the wine, which is shed for you. And as often as you take this, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. He is repeating, God in the flesh is repeating everything he said to Moses and Israel while they were in slavery. And here's Jesus about to go to the cross. And he is setting down the fulfillment of Old Testament parallels. And he's saying, this is the fulfillment. I am that lamb, and my body is the flesh of that lamb. Eat it symbolically through the unleavened bread, and my blood that will be shed on that cross is the fulfillment of every lamb that died innocently to to cover the sins in a figurative way of the nation and the people of Israel. The Lamb of God, the Lamb that God has prepared, has come to pay the price. What's really interesting, if you would just allow me for a couple of more minutes, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. And Paul says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There are two things we want to remember. Jesus Christ is God. God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And secondly, God deliberately knowing the truths, how broken we were, chose to be one of us, and then had himself nailed on the cross, though he was innocent. The innocent for the guilty. The innocent for the guilty. He who had no sin became a sin offering so that we can exchange and receive the righteousness of God. Amen. He became a curse so you and I could be curse free. Wow. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now watch verse 27. Remember seven days of unleavened bread and seven days of removing all the leaven from your house, searching your house, cleaning out the house? It's all symbolism. 
symbolically remove sin from your house. Watch this. Paul is talking to Gentiles in the city of Corinth. And he has to connect Hebrew religious ceremony, a pattern of things to come, to the realities that they, they now know. The Hebrews didn't know the reality. They only knew the symbolism. The Gentiles knew the reality. Jesus died for them. They didn't understand the symbolism. And so Paul says this. So then, verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of Jesus or of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. You know what he's saying? You need to go through your house. Test yourself. Check yourself out. He's not saying you can't come and have communion unless you're perfect because there would never be another communion. None of us are perfect. And we will not live a perfect life. But when we take communion, we've started to treat this lamb like he's the lamb in the field with 200, 300, 4,000 other lambs. No, this is the lamb. And when you take of his blood, take of it consciously and understand, I need to check my heart. Before I embrace this lamb, do I have sin against my brother? Am I angry and I want to knock someone's head off? Do I need to show a bit of truth and grace? I've seen some truth. I need to show some grace. Do I need to forgive someone? Do I need to repent? Because, Father, in my mind, I know I went places I shouldn't have gone. Father, I know I did this, this, and this. You see, communion is not for the people that are perfect. It's for the people that are still, <laughs> still have sin on their hands. And we come to communion and we say, Father, you know what? I was angry with Pastor Tom over there because he's more handsome than I am. And I, I, I was just so upset with him. I decided to give him a flat tire while he was in the office. I went and put a knife in his tire. I am so sorry. Not true. You are more handsome than me. But I didn't give you a flat tire. When it's time to come to communion, just like the beginning of the new year, they search their heart. David, the psalmist, said, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. You see, I realized that the best Christian is the most honest Christian. And the person you have to be most honest with is yourself. David says, search my heart. Lift my eyelids up. See if there's some wicked way in me. And if it's there, then show me. When I was... When my kids were just little babies, they'd jump on the bed with us, and we'd be asleep. Close your eyes for a minute. How many of you can relate to this? Close your eyes. Not, not tight, just lightly. And your little kids come, and they lift your eyelids up to see if you're there. Anyone home? Where are you, Dad? And David is saying, search my heart, and see if there's a wicked way in me. And then open my eyelids so that I can see it and take accountability for it and say I'm sorry. You see, communion's not for a perfect person. I come and I have communion to remind myself that I'm under the blood of Jesus. But I don't come with an arrogance and say, well, what I did, I did. I'm under the blood of Jesus. No, I say I am humbled and privileged to be under the blood of Jesus let me see, did I, did I offend you? Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. I need to make this right. And I, I spoke really harsh, terrible words to so-and-so yesterday. Father, forgive me. I mean, really, don't just forgive me so that I have relief. I am wanting to change my attitude on my behavior and help me to live right. I am sorry. 
Now, by your grace, by your spirit, by your strength, I know I'm cleansed. I know you've just forgiven me. And I know you're going to empower me to do better because I am the salt and I am the light. Paul says this to the church at Corinth because there was a lot of carnality. And he says, guys, you're having communion and you're screwing it up. Why? Because your hearts aren't right. You're prejudiced, you're angry, you're jealous, you have arguments, you're taking each other to court. Not on. When you approach the Lord's table, we know that none of us will live a perfect life without sin. But let's at least Go through our house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Go through your house. Search my heart. That's what David said. Let me go through my house and see if there's any leaven, some yeast somewhere. Hey? Is that good teaching? We need to apply it, don't we? Amen. I find it interesting that God told them, your new year starts with this celebration. In other words, the new year starts with your focus on God the Father and on you and getting your house in order. Maybe that's where the concept of new year resolutions came from. Would you stand with me? I want you to take a communion cup. They should be one in front of your seat there. And uh, if you take the little pointy triangle and bend it back and forth a few times, you'll eventually see that there's a thin, thin flap on top. You peel that back, and you will get a wafer. This is unleavened bread. It really is. I'm telling you that because when you put it in your mouth, I want you to be convinced it's unleavened bread. Because when I put it in my mouth, it tastes like styrofoam. (laughs) But thank God, it's only meant to be symbolic. It's unleavened bread. I like bread with leaven in it. But for the spiritual symbolism, unleavened bread. Jesus said, this is my body, perfect. Can you think of one thing that Jesus would have thought in a hateful, evil way? Could you think of one person that Jesus, under his breath, said, I want to just crush that guy? I can think of hundreds of things I've thought wrong. I could think of moments where road rage came to my head sometimes came to my mouth sometimes came to my hands and it wasn't a friendly hello (laughs) yeah I could think of a hundred reasons of why I don't deserve his great grace he came in truth he sees it all truth nothing gets away from him and he came in grace truth in grace I love that. He didn't come like a blind idiot. He knew exactly when he came to me, he knew exactly what he was getting. He saw the fact that even in the future, I'm going to screw up. He came in truth. When he came to me, he knew what he was getting. And he came in grace. I'm so glad he came in truth and he came in grace. If he didn't come in truth and he didn't know everything about me and he loved me like that, I'd I'd take him for granted and say he was an idiot. But I know that I know that he knew exactly who I was and he knows my failures tomorrow. He came in truth and he came in grace. (laughs) That's why I loved him. No one can love me like that. And no one can love you like that. He's an honest God. He's a God of truth. He can't look at you and make believe. He comes in truth and he comes in grace and he hugs us and he loves us and he accepts us. 
How can you reject a God that is so wonderful and so loving and so understanding? Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This unleavened bread represents his body. He said, I will let them spit at me. I will let them punch me. I will let them literally pluck my beard out. I will let them whip me 39 times. I will let them put nails on my hands and feet. I will let them mock me and then slam a crown of thorns on my head. I will allow them to shove a spear up my side. But I won't stop going to the cross for you, Lewis. He took Israel out of darkness. He took Israel out of slavery. He saved them from plagues and anything that could come up from the belly of hell as long as the blood of the lamb was on the doorposts. He made a covenant. He didn't ask you for your blood. He gave his. Because he knew you'd break the covenant. He knew he wouldn't break the covenant. Come on, how more incredible than this can you get it? How much more loving and amazing? How do you say no to such a fantastic, genuine, pure-hearted lover? This is his body. He became the sacrifice. He said you could be free. I want you to break this wafer like that. And stick it in your mouth and start thanking Jesus thanking God that he paid the price for your life now I want you to take the <clears throat> pointed part of the foil the harder piece and pull it back and you will have some grape juice there and Jesus said, this is symbolic of my blood. When you take the grape juice, I want you to imagine as if it is painting the frame of your body. Covering your head, the lintel, and covering the posts all the way down. And I want you to say, this is the blood that makes a covenant. No plague of hell. No breath of demons are meant to harm me. The blood of Jesus heals you, delivers you, saves you, rescues you. Wow. I want to pour this over the top of my head and make sure every inch of me is covered. But it is by the blood of Jesus. It is. And that's what we're testifying to. That's what we're remembering as we take this. I am covered so that the curses of hell have no legal right to be on me. Come on. Let's take the blood and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sat, uh, Wednesday, we celebrated Thanksgiving. We have a nation... Today we celebrate communion. We have a life. We have a heritage. We have a now. We have a tomorrow. We have a future. We are grateful. I want you to remember, communion is not for the perfect. They don't need the symbolism and the reminder of a Savior who paid the price. Communion is for people who aren't perfect. The last check and conversation I had with God, that's every one of us. Yes. But when we approach that table, we search our hearts. Don't treat communion like common goods. It's the lamb that lives in your house. When we have communion, whether you take it by yourself or we're doing it as a church, when you take communion, search the house and see if there's any yeast, any leaven. 
and then repent and say, God, you got me. Isn't it amazing he wants the Hebrew people to start their new year off like that? Wouldn't it be great we start our lives off like that half a dozen times throughout the year? <laughs> hey, listen, I don't live with you. You don't live with me. I live with me. I think I should do this every day. <laughs> Refocus. <laughs> Refresh. I will never get over how much God loves me. And I will never get over the fact I really don't deserve it. He's better than I deserve. And he treats me better than I deserve. How many of you could raise your hand and say, yep. Amen. Amen. Close your eyes. Jesus died for anyone and everyone. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't be part of me. He said this in the middle of a sermon. It had nothing to do with Passover. People didn't know what he was talking about. The Bible says that day many left him. What he was saying is, unless you accept the fact that I came to be a Messiah who would die on the cross for your sins, unless you can embrace me and the purpose I came for, you can't be part of me. When Jesus preached it, many left. I'm preaching it now. Will you decide not to ask Jesus in your heart? If you've never asked him, Will you let this moment go by and say, yeah, no, I'm not going to raise my hand. I'm not asking Jesus in my heart. Or having fully understood today why Jesus died on the cross and how much he loves us and how much he gets us. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, would you say yes today? Jesus, I embrace this. I'm going to put my trust in you. I want you living in me. I understand it. I'm getting it now. You love me. You want to treat me better than I deserve. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've done wicked things sometimes. At least I've thought them. Jesus, come into my heart. If that's you, if the Spirit of God is touching you, if you know you need to make your heart right with God, maybe you've walked away You've gone cold. Maybe you've never done this. Come on. While eyes are closed, raise your hands right now and say, that's me. I want to ask Jesus in my heart. Come on. Right across this auditorium. If that's you, just raise your hand and say, I accept Jesus Christ because he already accepted me. Amen. Those of you that are watching by live stream right now, as you've raised your hands, as others have raised their hands, repeat after me. Church, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me so incredibly. Thank you for becoming flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. Thank you for living with us and still deciding to die for us. I accept what you did. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. Jesus, forgive me. Come live inside of me. I'm going to allow you to turn me around. I want your influence in my life. I surrender to you. Jesus Christ, I believe you are God, and you died for me. Now come and live in me, and live with me for the rest of my life. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, let Pastor Tom know, or let me know. If you're here for the first time, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you in the foyer. We've got some pastry, danishes, and cheesecake. And to the rest of the church, I want you to know how much God loves you. 
he became a human being and lived with us and still went through with it. Dave, he was either crazy or he had the kind of love that I still have trouble understanding. And I'm convinced it's the latter. Why don't you turn around a half a dozen people, give them a high five, a fist pump, a hug, a kiss on the cheek, if that's your culture. Greet each other, love each other. And again, if you're here for the first time, come meet me in the foyer. God bless you.